So you want to change the world? Today's guest can help. Charlie Bressler of The Life You Can Save. Charlie, welcome to the show. Is that a big order? That's a huge order. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what we're doing, but we're hopefully doing a lot of good. Well, but the name of the organization is The Life You Can Save, and uh, I think you're talking about lives, many lives. Many lives. What we're hoping to do is significantly reduce over the next several years the amount of people who are living in extreme poverty, under a dollar twenty-five U.S. a day, and as a result, significantly reduce unnecessary suffering and premature death, which I think all of us can agree is not a good thing. Right. So it may not be creating structural change, but actual lives are getting saved and people are being restored to their families after years of suffering. And it doesn't matter where they are. The, well, the life you can save is going to be working with it. It actually, in a way, matters where they are because although there are a lot of suffering people in the developing world, maybe not many living under a dollar twenty-five a day U.S., actually the, our organization favors doing work in sub-Saharan Africa and South America, places where you can get more bang for your buck. So a, the dollar will go a lot further. So if you're donating a dollar, it will help somebody who can really benefit dramatically from one dollar, whereas it's a lot harder to create that difference in the developed world. Not that people in the developed world are worth less money or shouldn't be helped also, but we're focusing on getting the most bang for your buck. Just want to remind everyone, you can go to the website, thelifeyoucansave.org. It's up on the screen, and you can learn an awful lot more about the organization. And we're going to be talking with Charlie throughout the show about the organization and all the things that they do. But first, Charlie, we got to find out just a little bit more about you. You were in big corporate business. Actually, I started in not in big corporate business. I started uh, as a student activist, went back in the late 60s and mid, early to mid 70s. You were a hippie? Uh, I wasn't a hippie. <laughs> I was actually more of an ascetic. I was actually somebody who actually thought we could create uh, real structural change in the world mm -hmm. and help with wealth inequality and also end the war in Vietnam and work on civil rights in the United States. So. Big ambitions uh, from about 1968 to 1975 as an activist. And then about the time the war in Vietnam ended in 1975, I kind of dropped a lot of my ambitions and focused a lot more inwardly and later on my nuclear family. And I have to say, didn't do a lot of great things for the world for a, quite a long time. I was a tennis pro. I managed a tennis club. I worked as a psych tech. And then in a the early, tech? a psych tech, just meaning I did uh, some assessments of people who in extreme psychiatric problems in emergency rooms to support my tennis career. <laughs> uh, it wasn't like my earnings were going to support my uh, tennis habit. And then in the early 80s, my wife, who I'd met in high school, decided to go to medical school. I said, gee, I don't think I have a big enough ego to be a sort of weak tennis pro and a mediocre psych tech, so I better do something if I'm going to be around a bunch of arrogant doctors and <laughs> medical students. So. I I decided to go get my PhD in social and clinical psychology, which I did. I had a great experience at Clark University and got my master's and PhD, did a postdoc at Worcester State Hospital in Massachusetts, and I took a job as the director of behavioral medicine for the California School of Professional Psychology in Fresno and did that for seven years. By that time, Diane and I had two children. I was running marathons and leading a pretty self-indulgent life, except hopefully a good father and a good husband. Um, and I ran into, as we were moving to Northern California, George Zimmer, who was then the founder and CEO of the Men's Warehouse. And he asked me if I would come and start a training program for the Men's Warehouse. They had just gone public. I said, well, I don't know if you pay me a little bit more than I'm making running an anxiety clinic for a psychiatric hospital, I'd do it. He said, yep. And so I joined the Men's Warehouse, started this behavioral training program, and one thing led to another. And eventually, I was running marketing and stores and HR and was president of the Men's Warehouse until 2008. So that's what I was doing before The Life You Can Save. Wow. Quite a weird, circuitous route, I might say. Yeah. Yeah, so, but you have been on so many different sides of so many different things that the life you can save is probably a natural progression for you, isn't it? It feels like it's back to my values in terms of wealth inequality, and it feels like a breath of fresh air. I had amazing relationships with the people at the Men's Warehouse and just a great team of people. Um, but the work itself, running a retail company, wasn't exactly a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. And so when I went into George's office back in 2008, and we arranged for me to step down and have a consulting relationship and for me to be able to search for what I wanted to do. And then 
I don't know, around 2009, Peter published The Life You Can Save, and mm -hmm. it wasn't long after that that I read Practical Ethics, which is a serious philosophical work by Peter Singer, and then I read The Life You Can Save, which is an impassioned plea to fight uh, extreme poverty, and I wrote Peter an email. I said, can I help? And he wrote back and said, well, we're having these Skype meetings with a bunch of graduate students in philosophy. He said, you're welcome to join, and I did. And after several conversations between Peter and myself and my wife, Diane and I decided that we would put up the initial seed money to really get the organization uh, going and have a proof of concept. And we did that. And so now I'm really in the beginning, I think, of my third year as an executive director. Wow. One, one thing for sure, here on this show, we talk an awful lot with organizations that are doing big things. And no, no question about it, the life you can save is doing big things. But when I, I read this quote from Peter Singer, what I am hearing is something that's personal. He says, it's a central part of philosophy of ethics. What do I owe to strangers? What do I owe to my family? What is it to, to have a good life? Um, those are questions we face as individuals. Is, is that the premise that's behind the life you can save? Yeah, I think essentially what the, the, we start with the premise that, very simply stated, everyone's life is of roughly equal value and it doesn't matter where they live. And that's a t form of universalism. And not only is everyone's life of equal value, but we also start with the premise that unnecessary suffering and premature death is a bad thing. So for anybody who can accept those two things, then the next step is, well, if there are a lot of people suffering, maybe not right in front of me, but around the world, um, really suffering and dying deaths uh, from causes that could be eliminated many, many years ago in the mm -hmm. developed world, but are still, um, for lack of resources, exist in the, in the developing world. People are dying of those causes, and there's also unnecessary suffering from poor health, poor nutrition, poor sanitation, then the principle follows that I should do something about it. And I, it's not enough to just not commit a, um, a crime according to the Ten Commandments or to do something wrong, but that you have an active responsibility to do something good. And that is the, those are the premises of the organization, um, that we have an ethical responsibility to not only do, not avoid doing bad, but to actively do good. The modern economy in the world uh, really started uh, in World War II or right after World War II. In that period of time, in the last 70 years or so, most of the world has benefited positively by, uh, by a change to positive economic circumstances. Africa has not. Cor uh, um, correct, for the most part. Why? Well, uh, there's a long answer to those <laughs> questions. Um, and w without getting into a political diatribe, I think a good example of why not is what's happened in the extraction industries. So there's tremendous amount of natural resources mm -hmm. in places like Angola or Nigeria or South Africa, um, ranging from oil to diamonds to gold. And I think we all know that the people who live in the countries where those minerals are extracted and who also do the extracting at tremendous risk to themselves have not benefited. But the companies that have benefited and the shareholders who benefit are living in the developed world in Western Europe, the United States. Japan. That's a short answer to a more complicated question. So I, I, I guess the question is, is that are there, are there people who needed to, to uh, read the life you can save 50 years ago, even before it was done, so that what has happened in Africa couldn't happen? Or did we just thumb our nose at Africans because they weren't the same color as we are, they didn't wear the same clothes that we did, they just weren't like us? I think that the exploitation of, I'm just using the ex, uh, minerals as an example, mm -hmm. um, the exploitation of Africa and therefore Africans um, as a natural outgrowth of colonialism, which is, you know, started at least in the 16th century. So yeah. it goes back a, a long time and, and exists under feudalism in the early stages of capitalism. Um, and then as we move into the imperial period where uh, countries are at great profit ex, uh, benefiting from what goes on in Africa, I don't know that, uh, I don't think that reading The Life You Can Save would have changed the nature of the colonial or the imperial system. There were a lot of people reading, writing and reading about ethics before that. I think that uh, capitalism represented a, a social advance, particularly in the countries where it came into being, in the United States, France, England. 
um, not necessarily immediately for the working classes, but it was a positive development over feudalism, but still as an inherent part of capitalism, as many people have written, uh, imperialism uh, that was was a part of that and so people were not looking at it in a moralistic sense they were meeting their shareholders needs uh, their own needs their families needs and it grew inevitably as a part of a, of an economic and social system that we've all in in these countries many of us have benefited from and even the working class in the United States and Western Europe have benefited relatively speaking but South America and Africa not so much um, and and to a far lesser extent and even with the anti-colonial revolutions um, that began in the 19th and 20th century, mm -hmm. clearly they haven't freed themselves from that system. So this is beyond the scope of the life you can say, but I think provides the context for the poverty that we now experience. But the good news is that we can do something about it without having to alter the economic system because we can provide and have been providing uh, aid to people that can at least reduce or eliminate unnecessary suffering and premature death. Seven million children are dying under the age of five every year, but that number is dramatically less than it would have been had we just had a natural curve without intervention, say 30 years ago. So no structural change, but still tremendous positive improvements in the fight against extreme poverty and its consequences. Well, let's, what is extreme poverty? When you, when you really get a chance to look at it, what is extreme poverty? Well, I think the, the, the definition is that living under $1.25 US a day However, I think you've got to look at the social conditions. What it mm -hmm. means is that you don't necessarily have clean water. It means that when your child gets sick from a simple illness like diarrhea or from worms, they can't necessarily get a very inexpensive treatment. The food doesn't have simple things like iodine in it, so they get all kinds of malnutrition. People develop problems like trachoma, which has been pretty much wiped out in the West, um, but it causes blindness over time, or cataracts, which if you and I, at our advancing age, <laughs> get, we will get it taken care of relatively simply, but those services are not available as much in the developing world. So a good chunk, as much as maybe 80% of blindness, preventable blindness, exists in the developing world. So what extreme poverty really is, apart from the dollars that people don't have, extreme poverty is just not having the basic necessities of life to sustain millions of people and, and billions of people um, so that they can have uh, enough on their table food, which is more of a distribution than a, a growing problem, but they can have the health and sanitation necessary to live a decent life. So extreme poverty is a mom facing a child that could otherwise be saved but doesn't have the resources, um, or a mother struggling to get water and not having the time to do some of the other things that they would otherwise do. So extreme poverty is a grinding day-to-day uh, -day misery that is unnecessary and that a lot of people are doing something about. A really difficult question, and I know some people are probably thinking this very same thing. They, they heard you say that the, uh, the, the uh, children dying, uh, that it is greatly reduced. So then that means that children are living and we're already not being able to feed them very well. So um, is it, are we succeeding ourselves into another problem? Well, I think this whole Malthusian kind of analysis about whether or not overpopulation is an inevitable consequence of uh, fighting extreme poverty raises a whole bunch of issues that are important to address. Yeah, I but didn't so, say there was going to be anything easy about this. Right, I know. Maybe I should stop now. But, <laughs> um, but suffice it to say that, first of all, none of us would allow our ch own children to die or our neighbor's right. child to die because it might create some overpopulation problem downstream. Mm -hmm. If you saw a child drowning in the pond, as Peter has pointed out, you would jump in regardless of whether or not, hmm, if I let that child die, maybe we won't have as much population problems. So I think it is unconscionable to let people die in the present because of some abstract concern about the population. That said, concern about the population is downstream, like environmental problems and many other structural problems we have, something that needs to be dealt with. The good news is, that we find, and I don't mean my own research, but researchers find, and the evidence suggests that, for example, if people start to save their children, then they stop the popu their fertility goes down, their population growth goes down, because presumably families realize, you know what, if I have three children, you know, two of them aren't going to die. And so people actually start having less and less children as a result of the improvement in the economy. So in many ways, by supplying 
what is necessary to keep children alive, you actually can slow population growth rather than increase it. But population growth is an issue that we need to deal with on this planet. We're not going to be able to sustain 30 billion people. We didn't think we could sustain 6 billion people, mm -hmm. and we can actually do that. I think Armitria Sen and others have pointed out that we have plenty of food in the world. The problem is the distribution, distribution. system and who has the money to buy the food, not a shortage of food. I might point out, there's, as Sen does, there's never been a famine in a democracy. And so the food, the food is there. The question of how we get the food to people at six billion is, is, is the question. And then the further question is how many people can we sustain and how do we reasonably cut population without having to just let people die because, oh, well, we're, they're better, we're better off letting them die because we're going to have a population problem downstream. I don't know if that addresses what you're asking, but... I think it does. We're talking with Charlie Bressler, who's the executive director of The Life You Can Save. Be sure to go to the website, thelifeyoucansave.org. It's up on the screen. Learn an awful lot more, but you can participate as well. One thing that I wanted to, to uh, do uh, is go to this map that you, that you have on your, your website. And it's 50% of the world's population is in poverty. It's actually probably a little bit less than that, but certainly... There's a lot of people in poverty, and almost all of them in areas that we all know. Um, why is it that they're in, in those particular areas? Is it bad government? Is it bad people? Is it what? Well, again, I, I sort of, I think we can all agree that it's not like, you know, south of the equator the people are bad and north of the equator the people are good. Mm -hmm. So I think that argument uh, goes out the window for almost everyone. Yes. Um, bad governments are all over the world, depending on how one defines bad, but clearly there are very bad governments and distribution systems throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and South America, just to take the two biggest yeah. continents where extreme poverty exists other than Asia and South Asia. There are also problems with governments in Asia and South Asia, although many of those governments, most notably China, are getting much better at distributing resources in spite of issues that we may have relative to individual freedom and, and other things. Um, Although China has become a very capitalistic country even though that they have their government at the top is not. They have a very uh, interesting form of state, what I would call state capitalism, which is really different than the monopoly capitalism we see in the West or, or mm -hmm. the United States. But yes, there, all these governments are different. There's a lot of corruption. Um, there's a lot of corruption, I mean, in Chicago. There's a lot of corruption all over the place. But as far as why the poverty is there, I think you have to take a historical approach and realize what happened in terms of colonialism, really starting way back um, in the 16th century and, and likely before, and go through that history and understand what happened with the, um, how the colonial powers impacted, particularly the areas where there are extreme poverty now. And um, the reasons why Western Europe developed uh, in the way that it did when uh, there was much more um, kind of primitive, and I don't use that in a bad sense, but mm -hmm. primitive economies in South America and uh, in the indigenous economies in South America and Africa is a question sort of not only beyond the scope of this interview, but also really beyond the scope of me to ex explain. But I think for most viewers of this show and most people seeking an understanding, if they look at the history from 16th century, 1500, 1492, we're all used to in the United States, from 1500 through the imperial period, which continues in some form today, you can understand how this happened, but not just cutting cross-sectionally and saying in 2015, why is the southern part of the world less wealthy than the northern part, and how did that happen? It's unfortunately a complex historical question. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the good news is I keep coming back to is it's something we can do something about and are doing something about. And I guess what I want to say to the viewers of this show, the good news for them is it's something they can definitely do something about. Well, actually, that's a great segue because that's what I wanted to get into. Let's talk right about that right now. Here's a letter from Peter Singer, uh, the, who came up with the idea, wrote the book. Uh, he says this about what you're doing at The Life You Can Save. Uh, and it is our recommendations are intended to offer donors a variety of outstanding giving opportunities and provide them with the information they need to find those that best fit their beliefs and values. So basically, you're doing a lot of the work for donors to help them save the world. We are, well, again, I, I'm going to have to correct about <laughs> saving the world and try to limit the scope to fighting extreme poverty and reducing the consequences of extreme poverty, um, particularly in the health area. 
But first of all, we're not doing all the work. So let me be clear. There's an organization called GiveWell, mm -hmm. uh, GiveWell.org, and I think it'd be great if people could look on their website. We'll put it up on the screen. If you're a, a quant jock or you like looking at data, and GiveWell has an enormous amount of data, and they recommend eight charities, all of which we recommend. We also recommend eight additional charities, and we say that these 16 organizations are incredibly good giving opportunities, that you can leverage a dollar and get a tremendous amount of bang for your buck. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of those charities, but we believe that all 16 of these charities do provide an easy way for people who aren't going to do a lot of research themselves to have an outstanding given opportunity. Oddly enough, only about 35% of people do any research before they give money. We give them an opportunity to do a little research and come away with great charities, as does GiveWell. And so GiveWell, The Life You Can Save, um, all both have a really good opportunity for people who want to like research a little bit but don't want to get steeped too much in it. Mm -hmm. And we are saying you can count that the executive directors of these charities are making an enormous impact, whether it's against Malaria Foundation that's for $3 buying a bed net, and we'll get to the impact calculator. We give you an opportunity to look at the impact that your dollar can have. And we encourage people to do more research each year, to perhaps give away a little bit more of what they may have perceived as non-discretionary income, but actually is discretionary income. Mm -hmm. And we call it personal best. So whatever you did last year, do a little bit better this year and a little bit better the next year. And if you're ready to take the plunge, then we also have a calculator on the website that gives you a sense of how much we think maybe you should give away at a minimum if you want to take a pledge to give away a certain amount each year. Let's talk about the charity impact calculator that, that you just mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, what is it? Uh, how, how can we benefit from it who are particular uh, potential donors? So the impact calculator, which you can find on our homepage, gives you the impact that a certain level of donation will give for each of these 16 organizations that we recommend. And we have worked with the charities very carefully um, to try to develop an algorithm based upon the number of dollars, whether $100, $500, 1000 or more, what you can do. So you can pop that number into the impact calculator for any one of these charities, and then you'll see, oh, if I give this, I can perform seven fistula surgeries or two fistula surgeries, or I can have X number of women transported to the hospital, or I can cure 15 people of blindness because everybody has a different thing they want to do and a different mm -hmm. amount of money they want to give, and this allows you to track your own impact. Sounds like uh, you're helping people have accountability from their charitable dollar. Yes, and also that we want to make people feel like it's easy to determine how to have an impactful gift and to have confidence of that. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully as you spend more and more time on our website or GiveWell's website, you'll gain more and more confidence um, that you, you are not throwing your money away, that this is not a bottomless pit, that you won't have some corrupt dictator uh, steal your money, that in fact these executive directors are ensuring that this money will do the most good, uh, to use Peter's phrase. We got about five minutes left. We okay. got to get to these organizations okay. because I'd love to talk about all of them, but let's just talk about three of them. Uh, IPA, Innovations for Poverty Action. Innovations for Poverty Action is a little bit different than a lot of our charities because they're basically, for the most part, a research organization. They do what are called randomized controlled trials. So I'll give you one example. If we, we all know that getting children, particularly girls, to school has this enormous positive effects on mm -hmm. economies in the developing world. I won't get into the details. But then the question is, what's the best way to get girls and boys to school? Well, do you start a school uniform program, or do you deworm them and get rid of their worms? It's not an obvious answer whether the school uniform program or deworming program will work best. But if you want to get kids to school, one of those two, and there are a bunch of other things that, that IPA looked at, Innovations for Poverty Action, but what they did is they randomly assigned some people to the uniform program and some people to the deworming program. And what they found was astounding, that the deworming program was 14 times more effective. For every year of school you could get with the uniform program, you got 14 more years with the deworming program. Really? Why do you think that was? Well, I think what happens is, even though the long-term consequences of parasites are not well known, we, we have some ideas about them and the short-term consequences, I think that the worms make it 
very tough for kids to get to school. Yeah. And I think the uniforms obviously help, but they don't help as well. So that's kind of a simple answer, but it's not intuitive that it would be the case. And so that's an example that IPA does research in all kinds of areas, whether it's malaria nets or whether it's deworming and look at the effects using the gold standard of science, which is a randomized controlled trial. Wow. Let's go to the SABA. Is it SABA? SABA, yeah. SABA is a, a Berkeley, California-oriented charity. It's been around for a long time. They do amazing things, but I think the easiest way to understand them is that for somewhere between $50 and $150, they can restore a person who is either partially sighted or blind to sight. 47% of the blindness in the developing world is caused by cataracts. I mentioned that mm -hmm. before. Trachoma used to be uh, the, the biggest cause of blindness. But trachoma is getting under control. It's not completely under control. Cataracts require surgery, and the surgeries can be done in the developing world for $100 approximately. Imagine wow. what you can get in a U.S. hospital for $100. You might be able to get an orange juice <laughs> and a bedpan. Right. And so that's what we mean when we talk about most bang for the buck. So SAVA is a remarkable charity that has been restoring uh, blind people to sight. And all those years that people would live blind, they could otherwise have sight. And you can do that for remarkably few dollars. Uh, something that you see in the uh, developing world is, is fistula, and you don't necessarily see that anywhere else. So if obstetric fistulas um, have existed in the, in the United States, say, more in the 19th century and before, but with modern methods of childbirth, even home birthing, it's very rare. Basically what happens is a very young woman has a, has a child before she really is physiologically ready. This is the simplest explanation of an obstetric fistula. And as a result, there's leakage that goes from the colon um, uh, or the uh, bladder of either feces or urine, and it leaks out, um, and as a result, the woman has a horrible odor and is ostracized from her community, unable to take care of her children, and basically unable to integrate. For about $450, you can repair almost all obstetric fistulas that are existing in the developing world and the woman the young woman can be restored back into her community and she will likely not get another fistula down the road um, so it's not like it you just keep needing to do these operations um, and so these are very relatively simple surgical procedures that fistula foundation is training surgeons to do and and, and having them done in hospitals another amazing uh, organization uh, fistulafoundation.org uh, run by kate grant an amazing uh, charity. Mm -hmm. There are many other charities that I would like to talk about, but we don't have time. And there are many that are not on our website that are fantastic, too. All we're doing is providing our potential donors with the giving opportunities that we would like for ourselves and that we all donate to. Something I have to ask about, the giving games. It already sounds fun just by the name. Giving games are basically where we donate money or a donor donates money to charity A or charity B, but we don't donate the money. We give it to a university group of students, generally university, but it can be done anywhere. And these students debate back and forth where the money should go, thus having a really interesting philanthropy education experience, which is part of our mission. And in the end, the money goes to a great charity anyway. And so it's kind of an amazing leverage opportunity for donors. So for donors that want to have philanthropy education but still give money to great charities, they can do it through a giving game. Well, that's the question. We got, we got 15 <coughs> seconds left in five years. Where is the life you can save going to be? The life you can save is going to be closer to being a household name. People are going to be closer to feeling the kind of obligation and belief that they can help fight extreme poverty in meaningful ways. And there'll be lots of technological ways to do it really easily. And that will be the last word. Charlie Bressler, The Life You Can Save. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Stan.